overview of the book of Revelation. We're going to try to deal with the prologue and the exodus, that is, the introduction and the conclusion of the book. Before you, a couple of sample fragments of a third century manuscript of the book of Revelation, which is almost word for word exactly the same as much later copies from which your King James versions were translated. Now, I have learning objectives, what I wanted to learn from this book this week. You may have others. First, to review the manuscript evidence for the book of Revelation. Can we be certain that what we have in our Bible today is the same or very similar to what the author wrote nearly 2,000 years ago? And secondly, to identify the author and the date, if we can do so. Thirdly, to briefly analyze the structure of the book, how it's organized. And then fourthly, to exegete the prologue. What exegete, that's a college word. It means figure out, try to understand what it says and what it means. Right, just a couple of things about the earliest copies of the book of Revelation. First, it was written in the Greek language, which was very prevalent throughout the Middle East, including the Holy Land, from about 300 BC to about 300 AD. And so nearly everyone who traveled or was educated or was in business of any kind in the Greco-Roman Empire, used Greek every day. Just as Jennifer and I had to use French every day as the official language in the country we lived in, besides the daily language that we used. There are at least 10 manuscripts. A manuscript is a document that's written by hand, copied in Greek between the second and the fifth century CE. Many more after that, but the oldest documents are from, from that period. So here you have a fragment, papyrus number 98, copied about 200 CE. In other words, about a century after the original was written. Now, when we talk about copies of books of the New Testament, people get the wrong idea that Paul or John or Peter wrote a book, and then somebody copied it. Then somebody took that and copied that. And then someone took that and copied that. Now, if that were the case, how reliable would copies be a thousand years later? They would be so changed and different, you would have no idea what the original was. However, copying a copy and a copy and a copy in a straight line, that's not what happened. What really did happen? Well, John made seven copies himself, and he could compare them. Sent them to seven cities, and then in those cities, they made hundreds of copies of their version. And those were sent to other cities, and hundreds more were made. And so this fragment you see on your screen was discovered where? Not in Patmos, not in Ephesus, it was found in Egypt, where it had been taken and recopied and recopied. In order to determine what the New Testament really said, with a high degree of accuracy, <coughs> we compare hundreds of manuscripts. And in that way, scholars have figured out pretty well exactly what the New Testament actually said. So. Uh, as we go through this book, I will occasionally point out a word or a phrase about which the scholars aren't too sure. In this document, P98, there is one word that is misspelled. It has an extra letter in it. And it's missing two words that we know from uh, other copies were really there at the beginning. So the reliability, New Testament books remain amongst the best attested of all ancient documents. So when you read Aristotle or Plato or Xenophon in any language, it's made from a 
a set of how many manuscripts? One, maybe six, maybe as many as ten, none of which is complete. But when you compare the New Testament, there are not tens, not hundreds, but literally thousands of copies dated down through the centuries. So this makes, uh, makes our New Testament probably the most reliable book of antiquity. There are some theories about who John was. First, someone read for us these, these verses out loud. I, John, your brother, who share with you the transcription. I, John, I am the one who had it. So, this gentleman, we assume, named John, that's, that's how he identified himself, said little or nothing more. Right from the early centuries, there's been some question, discussion about who was John? In the second century, a church leader named Fabia, unless that was what his grandson called him, thought that this was some church leader, a bishop or an elder, who has happened to be named John. It still doesn't help us very much. A couple of centuries later, Dionysius, another church Christian leader, he said, well, it was probably written by John Mark. Remember who John Mark was? He's mentioned in the New Testament, possibly a son or a, a student of the Apostle Peter. And sometimes he was called Mark, other times he was called John. And then there are those who have surmised that the book of Revelation itself actually was, never, was not written as a Christian document. It was a Jewish book because the Jews, they had a literary style that was called apocalyptic. That was the use of images and symbols and almost verbal graffiti to describe the end of the world, where the Bible said history was moving towards. And since this book is in that style, they say, well, this must have been a Jewish book. Later, some Christians, possibly Jewish Christians, went through the apocalypse and they just added in phrases to make it sound Christian. There's one verse that says, from the one who was and is and was to come. Full stop. And then later the Christians came in and added, and from Jesus Christ. So is there any evidence that the apostle John, who had followed Jesus as a disciple, was the actual author of this book? What do you think? I think so, because he stated this was a vision that he, other apostles and John and, and Paul received visions from God in Jesus Christ, and that's well documented. Right, so the main argument is that the early church, when it was trying to figure out which writings were reliable and true, they decided together that we would accept only writings from an apostle or from someone whom the apostle had approved of. So, for example, the book of Hebrews. We're not told who wrote it. But we know that the apostle Paul approved of it, or at the very least, he approved of the teaching of whoever wrote the book, the epistle to the Hebrews. When we're talking back to about the book of Revelation, John got this uh, vision in an island of Patmos. Right. And he was a messenger. Yeah. The, it should, it's supposed to be in the Bible mm -hmm. as the last chapter. Right. Because the yeah. vision was a message to him, to the seven churches. Right, exactly. That's exactly what he said. But we're now trying to demonstrate that it was the Apostle John who received that vision and not somebody else. So, but in any event, in the second and third centuries, there were many other church leaders from both the East and the West who agreed that this was the Apostle John because they had heard this from their own teachers, and that you can trace that back to some who actually were students of the Apostle John himself. So scholars, when they're trying to uh, discern who wrote any ancient book, look at two kinds of evidence. One, what they call external evidence, what have others said about this book, and then internal evidence, what does the book say about itself? And so we point out that Whoever this John was, he was known and trusted by the Asian churches. Otherwise, 
they would have no reason to receive his vision as any more important than anything else. Secondly, the book is not ascribed to an ancient prophet or saint. Well, what's the point here? Well, those Jewish apocalyptic writings were usually attributed to somebody who had lived many centuries before. So there's the Jewish apocalypse of Abraham. Apocalypse, that's just the Greek word for revelation. Did Abraham write it? No. In fact, nobody believed he did. But it was a way of honoring Abraham by affixing his name to a later document. Thirdly, this John makes no attempt to bolster his own authority. Apparently, everyone knew who he was, and he was already accepted as an authoritative teacher from Jesus, so he didn't have to say anything about it. Yeah, all this reading from the scripture was said by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 5, that people will come in my name, right. a lot of people proclaiming that they are Messiah, they are right. prophets, right. and they deceive a lot of people. That is what we are seeing in most of these writings. So we're trying to ascertain, is this one of those reliable books that came from the apostles of Jesus to whom he gave those promises and warnings? And then others point out the language of the book is very similar to that of the Apostle John's Gospel and his epistles. So there's really no reason, no sound reason to doubt that the Apostle John was the author. But be aware of the fact that if your children attend a state university, they will be given the other view. And they will, some of them will lose their faith because they now know, understand the Bible is not reliable, it's false, they no longer have to pay attention to Jesus. So, our last point, early churches accepted only works written or approved by apostles. When was this written? Back in the introduction, we read from John, your brother, we share in the persecution. And so, what persecution was he talking about? Would that help us to date this book? Well, there are persecutions that are mentioned in the book. For example, John himself said, I was in exile. Uh, he mentioned uh, prison and death, that even one Christian named Antipas had been slain and Pergamus, and others were going to be slain for the faith and several mentions of the blood of the saints. So there must have been some kind of persecution going on, which means this was probably not in the earliest decades after Jesus. Those who reason this way, they have based this on a presupposition. They presuppose that the persecution must already have begun, since John mentioned it. In that case, what would it be related to? And most scholars say, well, the only reason the Roman government would persecute religious followers was if they were, were refusing to worship the emperor. We have to ask ourselves, well, where did this emperor worship come from? Well, it began with Julius Caesar, who of course had lived many decades earlier. But then we came to Caesar Augustus, who's also mentioned in the New Testament. He allowed himself to be worshipped though as far as we know, he did not demand it. But then we came to Caligula, who was right there in the middle of the apostolic period, and he demanded that others worship him, and that if his statue was put up any place, everybody had to come bow before it. And then there was Nero. We know that he abused Christians, at least part of the time. There's a tradition that when Rome burned, while he was actually absent from the city, and the violin had not even been invented yet, so he was not fiddling as Rome burned. He blamed it on the Christians. At least that's a tradition. And then Domitian, later in the century, he had a habit of <clears throat> exiling those who opposed him, his political enemies. And so when John says, I was exiled to the island of Patmos, Scholars say, oh, well, that's what Domitian used to do. Therefore, this book must have been written during the time of Domitian. In other words, sometime shortly before the year 96. However, there's usually another side to every story. Bruce Metzger, a great New Testament scholar, commented, no knowledge of any rescript document 
or edict has survived from the first century which enforced emperor worship. That is, Roman government documents that have survived and been found never mention it. But the book of Acts itself does mention persecutions that happen, usually resulting from charges wrought by local opposition. Now, who were the local opposition to the apostles and the message about Jesus? Jews. Traditional Jews, primarily. And whom were they objecting to? Christian Jews. So we have some alternate views of what may have happened. Uh, local persecutions were real, even if they were unusual. In many cities, there, there was no legal action taken. But occasional persecutions were never forgotten. And most conflict occurred between traditional Jews and Christian Jews. And so when Paul was dragged before the city authorities, what was the accusation brought against him? Something we don't like. But more specifically, something that's illegal. For in the Roman uh, Empire, there were two kinds of religions, licit religions, which were permitted, and illicit religions, which were not permitted. And so as long as Paul presented himself as a good Jew, arguing from the Jewish scriptures about a Jewish figure called Messiah, he was completely Jewish in his arguments. However, when he was brought before the authorities, they said, he, Paul is teaching about a deity that we don't accept, an illegal deity. And then, of course, the authorities were required to punish him or exile him or throw him into prison. And then, in all events, the book of Revelation is a prophecy primarily about future troubles rather than current ones. So what about the book of Revelation? What was its purpose? To strengthen Christians to maintain their loyalty to Jesus, even when insulted, scoffed at, threatened, opposed, abused, or murdered. So the central message then, as I take it, you can comment on this or object to it, is this. Jesus Christ will one day return visibly, will raise the dead, will reward the faithful, will destroy godless nations, will rule over the earth, will judge the wicked, and will create new heavens and a new earth. But it also provides us then with a philosophy of history. Why these 2,000 years that we're living through? What gives us meaning? Now, if you've ever lived overseas, you know that life can be really tough and difficult and is not, for the most part, is not very pleasant. And so, if you're a Christian believer in most parts of the world, you're wondering, why all this suffering? Yes, Christ will come again, according to what we read in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, these are the prophecies that God has to make it fulfill. Coming back to John the Living and a new world is what we have to believe in, that Christ, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. Amen. Intervening history includes bringing many, many more men, women, youth, and children to faith in Jesus. Lord Jesus actually said he would not return until his gospel had reached every nation as a witness to every ethnic group on earth. That God is also able to use both good and bad events at the present time to prepare us for a more glorious future. Something we're not going to do in such a short course as this is try to resolve everybody's questions, especially their theories and theologies. You know that evangelicals, at least our generation, our youth don't even know about this, but our teachers used to argue endlessly about their theories surrounding the timing of Jesus' return to Earth. Would this be <clears throat> At the start, before a future tribulation, is there going to be one? Or at the middle of it, or at the end of it, or before the thousand years, whatever that is? Or at what point will believers be resurrected? And then there's the question of what is the tribulation? That Revelation only mentions that word once. 
as the Great Tribulation, which was a Jewish concept, by the way, borrowed from Jewish writings. And for the Jewish community, the Tribulation started with their exile to Babylonia and continues to this day, waiting for the, for the coming Messiah, depending on your perspective. Others say, well, no, that was the seven years of the Roman occupation of resulting in the events of 70 AD. And would it be a seven-year tribulation, which is nowhere mentioned any place in the New Testament, or three and a half years, which is the only time that's provided in the book of Revelation? We're going to leave those questions unanswered. There are four Western views of the end times. That is to say, most of the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't think about these things. Euro-American theology have wrestled with these ideas, one of which we call historical pre Millennialism. How do you say that? Millennialism. The idea that Jesus will return before some future millennium. Historical for, for two reasons. One, it will happen in history. And secondly, this is what Christ, most Christians held historically. Then there is so called dispensational premillennialism, which was an English world invention of about a century and a half ago that Christians till then had never, figured, had never thought of. And this was the doctrine that Jesus will return sometime around a future seven year tribulation period. The dispensationalists are not too sure whether Jesus comes before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or following the tribulation. Those are all evangelical doctrines. But we won't try to resolve that question. But there is the doctrine of amillennialism which basically says that Jesus may return at any time because there will be no millennium. Millennium is just a symbol for either the future condition of things or the present time that we live in. 1,000 can only be a symbol. But then there's a doctrine of post-millennialism, which was prevalent in Western countries during the time of colonial expansion of the European powers into Asia, primary Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The Catholic missionaries, and later the Protestant missionaries, they followed the colonial powers. The feeling was that the world was going to be evangelized through the colonial powers protecting the, the work of Christian missions. And as the world became more and more Christian, it would become better and better. Except in Indonesia, where the Dutch government gave to the company the power to decide who could live in the colonies. And the Dutch outlawed Christian missions in Indonesia. And so during that period of colonization of, of Indonesia, Islam spread through the whole country. So you can thank the Dutch for that. Postmillennialism said Jesus will return after we have Christianized the world, then the king will come back. However, two things happened that kind of messed up the, the prospect. What was that? World War II. And World War I, and a number of them since. Oh, and how many Russians were killed yesterday in Ukraine? We're not going to advocate for any one of these views in this short course. Just be aware that the book of Revelation is used to try to prove them. So how is this book organized? Depends on whom you read. There are those who say the book of Revelation has so many little different stories in it that are kind of mixed up that it's probably lots of different little traditions that somebody just threw into a document as a kind of patchwork. Uh, if you are a dispensationalist, fundamentalist, evangelical, then you take the book of Revelation as one long sequential calendar. And your task then is to show how every event in the United States fulfills the book of Revelation. If the book of Revelation was written about the United States, then of course, for 1800 years, nobody reading the Bible understood it because it was talking about something unknown to them. So I don't think that current political events are necessarily fulfilling the book of Revelation. So what shall we do with it? Now, scholars have pointed out for many years that there are cycles within the book of Revelation, sets of events that are described more than once. 
And others have pointed out that these cycles follow a pattern. Each of the cycles starts with a vision of something that's going on up in heaven. And the events of heaven then have their fulfillment on earth. And then those events are described, and all of those events lead up to a time of praise and adoration towards the living God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In any event, the Greek tragedy it point, uh, is pointed out followed a fairly consistent pattern. Tragedy just means a play in, in Greek. And it starts with a prologue. A prologue kind of announces what this play is about, and where it came from, maybe the author. Then it's followed by a parodos, which means an entry. And the parodos describes all the characters in the play and what the plot is. The parodos then is followed by four, five, six, or seven episodes. And the episodes follow a pattern, which we've already identified. And so uh, the, then the play ends with the exodus. That's, of course, you're on the way out. The, you revisit the prologue, and you kind of conclude that the villain of the story got what he deserved. The heroes have been exonerated. And so if we can take the book of Revelation, and its cyclical pattern, it fits nicely into the Greco-Roman tragedy. Since this book was written in the first century, the Greco-Roman tragedy was the primary medium of entertainment throughout the empire. And so it, what it looks like is that the Apostle John, having visions of what was yet to come, laid them out in a pattern that could be read and even acted out. However, one thing we notice is that these episodes apparently overlap. So ep episode one will have a period of time. Uh, episode two will jump to the end times. Episode three will go back to the present time, the time of John, and will paint a description of, the, of history all the way up to the end time. In episode four, we'll come back and look at those end time events again, the wrath of God being poured out. Then episode five, we'll jump to the far future of what follows with the return of Messiah and the new heavens and earth. Now the book then actually gives us a time frame for the end time events, which is called in some verses a time, times, and half time which is actually defined as 42 months, is further defined as 1,260 days. And these events are laid out in a three and a half year framework. All right, let's get into the prologue. Let's go, let's, let's read the scripture. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Square brackets, that's where some of the old manuscripts have a different word. Instead of servants, some of them have saints. Now, is that a contradiction? Not exactly, because it's uh, talking about the same folk. What stands out to you in these verses? First one, again, Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. So that would be disciples, mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. which he said he would show them right. visions of what is to come. Right. Jesus had said to his apostles, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of everything I've said and will reveal to you the things to come. And these are the promises of God before the revelation and even the, uh, the Whatever we can say is different from what we are reading. Mm -hmm. It's part of the promises. Yes. So we. Uh, this is actually a fulfillment of the promise of Jesus. He said he would reveal these things, and he came and did it. What does this mean, sending his angel to his servant John? There's an angel between Jesus and John. Who do you suppose that is? We can say John is a saint. Yes. The angel is different. An angel is different. It's a messenger. An angel 
is a spirit being out of heaven with a message. Blessed is the one who reads the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. What do you uh, underscore? Blessed, the one who reads and those who hear it. What does blessed mean? It's a religious word. The term here of revelation is the Greek word apokalypsis, which means an uncovering, an unveiling, a revealing. We can interchangeably talk about the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. will mean the same thing. In fact, I think European languages all call it Apocalypse. Here's the path by which it came from us. First, it comes right out of heaven from God, given to Jesus Christ, who is exalted to the right hand of God. Jesus then commits it to an angel. An angel comes down and appears to John and talks to him. And John then writes down what he hears and describing what he sees in his vision and sends this to seven capital cities where there are networks of house churches. As far as we know, they didn't have edifices in which they got together as big congregations. Well, they may have one. And then within the churches, there were those who were the readers and the others who were the hearers. What determined whether you were a reader or a hearer? According to the message to the seven churches, some of them were not in contrary to the message that Jesus was when he was on earth. Then, because they, they were serving another God or preaching thing against uh, something, a world against uh, the coming of Jesus Christ back. But many of the early seekers had not yet made their break with the pagan gods, and this was a great book demonstrating why it's important to do so. Remember, in ancient times, as in some countries that we're from, the majority of folk simply do not read, or they don't know how to read. Yeah. In fact, in the state of Oregon, you can now receive a high school diploma without an ability to read. Right. Blessed, my lexicon means basically to be happy or privileged, and Jesus used the term as a way of approving the godly, when he said, blessed are the pure in heart. Yeah, they're happier, but he's saying, I approve. Hearing and keeping, the Greek construction here, says these are the same group. They're not the hearers and then the keepers. It's those who do both. And what does it mean to keep? To persist in obedience. In fact, the verb here in the New Testament is often translated obey. In other words, you listen in order to do it. And the term near. All right, if these events were near for John, here we are 1,900 years later, how near is that? Well, this term can be used for near in space, like you know, Randy and I are near. That can be used in time. Well, we got out of the service just half an hour ago. That's pretty near. But it can also be near in sequence meaning the next things to happen in God's calendar for the earth, these are what we're describing. So if you can, it's the advantage of speaking more than one language is to realize that translated words often don't mean quite the same thing. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace to him who is uh, and who was and who is to come uh, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne or his throne and from Jesus Christ this faithful witness the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth thank you all right clear enough yes what Jesus Christ is the king of kings he is um, that's why he sent the message to through John to the seven churches because mm -hmm. it was only two churches in that time that we are complying about Jesus coming back to the world to the church. Mm -hmm. He's king of kings and of course he's our king in particular. He will one day be king over all the governments of the world. But there's something else in there that usually puzzles Christians. Seven spirits? spirits? Yeah, the seven Before spirits. Rome. Right, yeah. What are those? Uh, if you read commentaries, Christian theologians who, for the most part, are so rationalist 
that they hardly believe at all in the spirit world. Or there used to be a spirit world, but Jesus did away with it, and so everything is just now human. The only spirit they know of in theology is the Holy Spirit. So this must be a, a symbolic reference to the Holy Spirit. Why would he be called seven spirits? Because he's the whole thing? To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Right, you notice that, uh, again, we have a word here between square brackets, instead of freed us from our sins, from the 6th century on, some manuscripts say, washed us from our sins. Here's the difference between the two Greek verbs. Luo, luo, you hear it? Luo, luo. All right, if you speak French, I and u, i, u, i, u, very distinct sound. Well, whereas in English, those are homophones, say our words either way. Well, what often would happen in Christian churches, was they were making their copies of the book of Revelation, you'd have a reader who would read what was in front of him or her, and then you had the copyist who would copy down what he heard read. And if you could not distinguish luo from ruo, it's the wrong word, but is it a contradiction? No, he washed us from our sins. <laughs> he also loosed us from them. He not only forgave us, but he broke the power. In any event, the oldest or earliest manuscripts read, he freed us from our sins by his blood. Well, let's uh, deal with this. What are churches, if not we who believe in God and are loyal to Jesus? See, if, you don't, if you're not loyal to Jesus, you may still believe in God, but are you a church? What are you? You're a synagogue or a mosque or a temple. All right, grace and peace to you cause and effect. He loves, we live. And God is defined here for us as he who is, was, and is to come. He is the deity who always was, still is, and always will exist. Oh, Jordan Peterson, he says, God is the spirit who reveals himself. What an excellent way to put it. Kind of avoids all the arguments about whether a God can exist or not. But anyway, our scripture says, this is the spirit who has always been there. He still is, he always will be. But the seven spirits, then, are mentioned elsewhere in the book of Revelation, where they're called the seven angels. Well, why in one verse would they be called the seven spirits, and in other verses called seven angels? Well, what is an angel? Sorry? A heavenly spirit. A, is a messenger, yeah. Who is a heavenly spirit. Now, while his spirits are in the heavens, they're not angels, guardians of the heavenly throne, or they're praising God. But when God says, all right, take a message to somebody, that spirit then becomes an angel. In other words, bearing a message. So angel is not a class of spirit beings. Angel is a job description. And any one of the many kinds of spirits described in, in the Hebrew Bible and Hebrew generally called angels in the Greek Bible, find that there are many kinds. All right, Jesus then, he taught, he died, he rose to life, he reigns over all. And by his blood, faith in Jesus' blood brings us freedom from our own evil and gives us authority over the spirit world by our access to God. We are called a kingdom of priests. A kingdom meaning we have a king, we have a gracious king a righteous king, a kind king, a providing king. Well, we are, we are a kingdom. We are not cut loose to simply follow our own whims and desires. Look, he is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, so it is to be. Amen. Thank you. All right, some manuscripts, instead of with the clouds, say it's on the clouds. This, I believe, is the principal message of the book of Revelation. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth. Well, wait a minute. Is this invisible? Uh, is it uh, quiet? Is it secret? No. Is it unannounced? It has to be already announced. At the end of the age, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. 
when you see him coming, then start looking up, because your redemption is drawing nigh. That is to say, your resurrection is soon going to happen after you see Jesus Christ appearing in the clouds. Amen. It may be hours, it may be days, it may be months, but that's when you start looking up.